Hello and welcome to this conversation with Dr. Sushaina Suboff and EU Communicia and Vice President Margrethe Vestager. My name is Thomas Damke Petersen and as President of the Danish Society of Engineers, Ida, I would like to thank you for joining this webinar on technology, data, business and democracy. The idea of democracy is beautiful. The idea that we, the people, should have the power to govern a society together. That we are the power, the highest purpose of everything. Democracy is beautiful, but it needs to be, to be protected. The balance of power between state and people can have a delicate tipping point. Maintaining the right balance has always been something we have needed to ensure a fair and healthy society. In recent decades, we have seen a new type of power that challenges the power of the state and the people. Surveillance capitalism, the power of multinational companies to predict and impact future markets by using and trading on the data they collect on private human behavior. There is no doubt that we benefit from the company's data and their work with artificial intelligence or AI, but there is also no doubt that we should find a way where we, the people, are in control. How do we go from digital disposition to real democratic and digital empowerment? I believe that digital technologies and the uncontrolled trading of personal data pose big challenges to our democratic rights, but nothing is lost yet. We are fighting back at an intellectual and political level. My organization, EDA, the Danish Society of Engineers, represents 125,000 technology experts in Denmark. And our members include the people who develop the systems and ethics behind the technologies of surveillance capitalism. And this webinar is also an internal call for us to think about and rethink the products we develop. Today, EDA has the honor of bringing together two of the strongest voices in the debate on the implications of digital technologies and the trading of data on private human experience. I would like to thank you for joining us, Dr. Sushaina Suboff, the founder of the concept surveillance capitalism. And thank you also to the European Commission's Executive Vice President for Europe with fit for the digital age and competition, Margrethe Vestager. And I'm also grateful that Professor Mikkel Flyverbom from Copenhagen Business School has agreed to moderate this discussion. I look forward to hearing all your views on where technology regulation should be heading. Thank you again. And now I will hand over to Mikkel Flyverbom. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Welcome everyone to this conversation. I'm so happy that you join us from wherever you are and uh, welcome to both of you for joining the way we do it now, both in person and via video link. Um, I can't think of two people in the world who have done more to sort of show us that the digital future is something that we can shape, something that we um, have to uh, um, work on and something you know, to articulate that we can have digital <laughs> technologies um, without giving up values There's like democracy, here. fundamental rights and so on. Welcome. So I think it's important to, to stress from the outset that it makes no sense to talk about, um, to, to sort of talk for or against technology. I don't think we can think of any human progress without technology. So I think the questions we need to ask and discuss today are really about how we can have digital technologies. Can we have digital technologies and the benefits they give us on other terms and conditions than the ones we get today? So um, I've also gotten questions from the audience and I'll bring some of those in as we walk through this um, conversation. Um, but there are too many questions for, uh, for me to bring in all of them. So let me first introduce Susanna Suboff, who is joining us on a video link from Maine. Susanna Suboff is the author of an amazing book in my mind, The Age of Surveillance Capitalism, um, The Fight for a Human Future at the New Frontier of Power. This book is big in so many ways. It has it's full of ideas, it's been translated into 17 languages, it's a bestseller in many countries, and it's also a, a book that has been picked up by uh, reviewers and newspapers around the world. So as, as, associate, as Associate Press put it, um, 
Susanna dropped an intellectual bomb on the tech industry with this book. So without going into details, the book warns us that um, against the sort of the consequences of, um, of the business models and the commercial desires of uh, tech companies, Silicon Valley companies like Google, Facebook and Amazon and so on. But um, the point is not that the, or the problem as such is not technology itself. It's rather the kind of commercial logics, the kind of um, the, the, this attempt to sort of turn human behavior into a raw material that can be uh, turned into profit. Just like we saw in previous times that nature was turned into a raw material for, for different kinds of, of profit. So really with your term surveillance capitalism, I think you capture how digital transformations also can undermine democracy, undermine um, the freedom to determine our own future. With me here in Copenhagen, I have Margrethe Vestager. I think your impact in the tech field started in your role as commissioner for, um, for competition, but it's only been strengthened in your role, your current role as executive vice president of, um, of this, um, the commission with responsibility for, for, for Europe in a digital age. So I think as a result of your bold approach to some of these issues, we have seen a much stronger focus on how the tech industry can be regulated and in some cases fined and that we can have the same kind of expectations um, to the tech industry that we have to all other normal companies in a sense. So I know that the two of you have met before mm -hmm. and um, both in person and through your writings and statements and so on, but I believe that this is the first time we bring you together in a conversation, Indeed. in a public conversation. <laughs> um, is that so? Well, well, as you say, we met in person. Um, an, an amazing uh, thing at, uh, at Louisiana uh, here, as you, you praise uh, Shusana's uh, work, um, it, is, it is very much also an inspiration for me. So, uh, so in that respect, I'm very, very happy to be here. Wonderful. I have many questions, but I think I'll start out with two opening questions. And the first one goes to Shusana. So when you bring up, when we, you know, in conversation, with our friends and colleagues and so on, bring up this question of the importance of privacy, the importance of uh, you know, not carrying out surveillance and so on. The response is often, I have nothing to hide. How can we respond to those types of uh, positions? All right, well, maybe that's a good place to start, Mikhail. And first of all, let me just say thank you for organizing this and thank you both for this uh, beautiful introduction. So, uh, Margaret is uh, is a hero uh, in my in my view. Uh, she is uh, one of the great heroes that I live with in my mind all the time, <laughs> and I'm I'm so so proud of uh, Margaret and the incredible work that she has done and is doing now. So this is really a great great honor for me. Um, we have succumbed to a kind of propaganda. If you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to fear from our sensors, our devices, our surveillance. This is an authoritarian propaganda because um, <clears throat> let us look at this from below and from above. First of all, from below, when we think of democracy, we think of individuals. We think of individuals with free will. We think of individuals with autonomy and agency. These capabilities of freedom, autonomy, agency are things that we nurture within us. They are born from inner life. They are born from what by the 19th century came to be called private life. They are born by our capacity to reflect inwardly and to contrast what we feel and think to what we are being told on the outside and to be able to assess for ourselves um, moral judgments and impose moral values. The whole idea of civil disobedience is the idea that we can uh, reflect on higher values than those that are being imposed upon us and act accordingly. So a private inner world is essential for the kind of individual human life that goes with democracy. Without that individual inner life, there is no democracy. So that's from the bottom, from the top. If 
everything is transparent and there is no privacy, we have fundamentally changed the kind of society we live in. A society that cherishes privacy is a society that cherishes freedom and autonomy and democracy. What we see is that when we succumb to this idea of total transparency, they take our faces, they take our bodies, they take our bloodstreams, they take whatever they want. These are used for data sets. As we've seen in facial recognition, they take our faces, they put them into data sets. Ultimately, we've seen, as in the case with Microsoft, their facial recognition training data set sold to military divisions, including military divisions in China, who keep the Uyghur people imprisoned in Xinjiang based on facial recognition systems built from our photos. So there is a public dimension to our willingness to succumb to this authoritarian doctrine. We need an inner life, we need sanctuary to be a democracy, and we need societies that are structured by that respect for the individual if we are to have a free democratic society and a free world. Thank you. So an opening question for you also. In many ways, we see a sort of attempt to balance questions about regulation and innovation and so on. But isn't Europe in some ways sort of digging its own grave, both in terms of um, innovation, in terms of, um, of um, financial means and so on, by sort of being the one that focuses on questions about digital responsibility? Because at present, obviously, the companies who are not so focused on these, these issues are the ones prospering in the digital, in the digital space. So I wonder, can we both have sort of digital leadership from Europe and digital responsibility, and what will it take? Well, I think this idea that you either have regulation or innovation is as false as if you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to fear, as false as competition is just one click away. It's all falsehood, and one shouldn't listen, because we're, we're dealing with something very fundamental. Uh, in Europe, we have always been willing to balance things. Mm -hmm. uh, we, of course, enable uh, farmers to use pesticides, but only as long as we still can have biodiversity and clean drinking water. Uh, if you said, well, I don't care about biodiversity, I don't care about drinking water, of course you could, you could probably have a much larger use of pesticides, but we say no because this is not balancing things out. Mm -hmm. And it's exactly the same thing here. Uh, of course, you can have uh, innovation, because in the example of the farmers, well, then less harmful pesticides are developed. Uh, organization of farming is changing in order to use maybe more machinery, uh, because you have to innovate because democracy have set new boundaries because of biodiversity and clean drinking water. And the same thing here because we are responsible for our societies. We are responsible for what kind of society do we want. And, and that will provoke another kind of innovation than the innovation who doesn't care about human um, dignity, integrity, uh, and the very uh, basics of democracy uh, that the, the chairman just uh, very beautifully uh, summed up, that the, the individual uh, is where the power uh, lays. So, so I don't think that anyone should, one should accept that, that this is, is the truth. On the contrary, we have seen over decades and decades and decades that innovation can thrive also based on human choices in balancing things. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. So the, the next topic I want to address is really if, if there's a sort of European way um, into our digital future and what, what would that European um, uh, way look like? So maybe, Shosanna, you will... Um, talk a little bit about um, both the sort of what are the possibilities for a kind of European approach to digital transformations and maybe also just um, highlight some of the differences in terms of geopolitical differences between China, Europe and, and the US when it comes to dealing with some of these matters. Well, look, this is such an important question and um, and I think uh, Margaret will agree that it, it frames everything that we're here to talk about today. Look, the, the pandemic has been a stress test for our democracies 
in much the same way that the financial crisis was a stress test for our financial systems. And of the many vulnerabilities that have been laid bare, uh, the, the, our vulnerability to the digital is uh, right up at the top. And I think what we've discovered is that um, we are essentially marching naked mm into this digital century without the charters of rights, the legal frameworks, the regulatory paradigms, the institutional forms, and the kind of leadership that we need to make the digital future compatible with democracy and to actually amplify and deepen and advance democracy. Here's an analogy. Imagine that we try to live decade after decade through the 20th century without child labor legislation, mm -hmm. without the kind of legislation that made it possible for people to join trade unions, for people to bargain collectively, that gave people the right to strike, without institutions like unemployment insurance and uh, the institutions that looked over uh, to make sure that working conditions are safe, to make sure that food and medicines are safe. All of these and many, many more charters of rights, legislative frameworks, and institutional forms mm -hmm. were invented. They were invented during the third and fourth and even into the fifth decade of the 20th century. And it was only that tremendous fertility and creativity that ended up making industrial capitalism safe for democracy mm -hmm. so that something like market democracy could flourish for society, for people, as well as for uh, commerce. We do not have that yet. We have not been through this process yet. So we are naked. To contrast to China, just for a moment, the Chinese grasped this very early. At least since 2010, the Chinese, led by the Chinese Communist Party, have been intentionally crafting their vision of a digital future and building it. And their vision is one specifically that is designed to advance their form of government, which is an authoritarian state. They advance their form of government domestically, and they create the technologies and the training systems and value systems to support those technologies, which they export. And we now know at least 36 countries where these training systems and surveillance technologies, authoritarian technologies, have been exported and implemented. The Western democracies, Europe and the United States included, have failed to undertake this project. We have failed to envision the digital future that will advance democratic government. That is the big work now. And that is why I'm so proud to stand with Margaret because she and her colleagues at the European Commission and within the EU government are under, have grasped this and are beginning to do the work that puts them at the frontier of this critical problem without which our century will not remain democratic. So how far are we into this, in your opinion, Marede, in terms of uh, building the institutions, building the frameworks, um, that, that will uh, make sure we don't walk naked into this digital future. We've seen an explosion in committees, working groups, white papers, all these types of um, activities that lay the foundation for this kind of work. We've seen general data protection becoming a key component of regulation and so on. But how far are we to, to you know, how, how close are we to not being naked in, in the sense that Shoshana is talking about? Well, I, I'm afraid that we only have a thong. Uh, <laughs> it's it, we we still have so far to go. Well said. Uh, before we are really comfortable, 
Uh, because as you say, yes, we have taken important steps. Mm -hmm. uh, the GDPR is a kind of digital citizen's rights mm -hmm. that we can control our data. But, but now we have the rights. We still need to go further to enforce them. Mm -hmm. uh, we begin to see a market response, market picking up to say, we will enable you to enforce your rights, but we still have a way to go. And uh, when I see what we're doing on artificial intelligence, on uh, how to create data spaces uh, that are safe, mm -hmm. uh, how to make sure that we do not just recreate uh, the problems of the old world. And well, it's not even carving them in, in stone, it's integrating them in every network uh, that we have. On that, we are still, you know, uh, it's so much work in progress and, and the pandemic uh, and sort of that crash course in doing everything digital mm. have shown that it's a matter of urgency. Mm. We really cannot wait uh, to get this done. Uh, it's both in the marketplace, but it's definitely also in our, our democracies and in the information. Uh, of course, it's, it's a right uh, to have information that you can verify, mm -hmm. uh, but we're still also here uh, just in the beginning, in enabling people uh, not to uh, not to be manipulated, that you yourself have the tool to see: Do I believe this, or is it not only too good to be true, but also too bad to be true? So we still have way to go. Mm. And Shosana, what do you think about if you look at the kind of initiatives going on in a European context, and think about them in relation to your diagnosis or your story about surveillance capitalism? Will those types of strategies, those types of developments, address what you are concerned about? Well, we're not there yet. And, um, and I, I love uh, Margaret's response, we, we've got a thong. We've got a thong, um, but we also have um, understanding the, uh, the, the reasoning and the vision that has begun to come out of the European Commission and the EU. Um, we we have already forming this this grasp of what the work is, and you know we see that grasp also emerging in the UK, and believe it or not, uh, in in the United States where things have have lagged obviously in this conversation, uh, just in the last year, we've had now counting what's happened in the last couple of months, we've had. Um, 29 key bills coming out of the Senate, the House, or both, that are that are directing themselves into important issues in this space. Not a comprehensive vision like the one that we're seeing being developed in the EC, but but again, toothpaste out of the tube. In order to really come to grips with the with the facts of surveillance capitalism, I think we have to come to grips with a deeper problem. How did we get to this place where we failed so miserably to, to create the systems that we need for a digital democratic future? This goes back to a specific moment in history. This goes back to the day that the Twin Towers fell. Because in the United States on September 11th, the conversation about the internet and the digital future changed dramatically. People were poised to be considering comprehensive federal privacy legislation on that day. With the terrorist attacks, that conversation changed very, very quickly to one called total information awareness. And this new obsession altered the way that from Washington, they looked at these fledgling internet companies in Silicon Valley, Google right at the forefront, who were already on record with the Federal Trade Commission as violating privacy rights with the cookies and the web bugs and the various early tracking procedures that they were uh, implementing. As a result of the so-called war on terror, Washington developed an unwritten doctrine that I've called surveillance exceptionalism, the idea that these budding tech companies would be allowed to develop their surveillance capabilities outside of democratic oversight, outside of constitutional constraints, and that ultimately 
these massive oceans of human-generated information that the tech companies would provide um, would be available to the state when they needed to avail themselves. And we won't go into all of the programs and everything that we've learned about how this worked. But the point is, there was an unwritten doctrine that allowed the state to pursue surveillance and allowed the companies to develop and amplify, root and, and, and elaborate a complex economic logic called surveillance capitalism, uh, which has now become the dominant economic logic. So what we have is for these last two decades, our democracies chose to be surveillance societies instead of choosing to be democratic societies with the digital underneath that umbrella of democracy governed by, overseen by, infused by democratic values and constrained by democratic con uh, constitutional constraints and rights. This is the nub of it, Mikhail. We have to choose. Are we going to be surveillance societies or are we going to be democratic societies? Because it is the failure to make that choice that has left us compromised, that has eroded the trust between citizens and the state, and that has, le has left us vulnerable to this authoritarian economic logic of surveillance capitalism, which has now come roaring back, no longer as fledgling startups, but now as immense information empires of unaccountable power. So I think we should return to this topic of how particular moments in time or particular crises come to shape um, our digital future, just like the crisis we're facing right now or in the midst of right now. But before I do that, could I just ask you to maybe reflect a little bit, Margarita, about how ideas such as those mm. offered by uh, Susanna Zuboff in, in her book on surveillance capitalism, how can ideas shape the kind of work you do? What, what's the role that intellectual ideas or attempts to sort of uh, offer us a, a diagnosis of our present time, how can they inform the kind of work you do? And to which degree but, but, do but, that? But it, can, it cannot be overestimated how important it is. Because, um, you know, one of the reasons I like magic shows is that it is, it is sort of a, you're notified that you're being chip tricked. Mm -hmm. You know something is going to happen, you don't know how it works, but you know you're being tricked. And what the work of, uh, of Shosana and, and other intellectuals are doing is basically to, to make that transparency. Something is going on here that you should be aware of. Mm -hmm. You're being tricked, and, and these are actually the mechanisms uh, as to what is happening. And, and without those insights and that clarity, well, of course, it's, it's not possible for our, our democracy, for our, our legislature, to see clearly mm. and, and to, to take the necessary steps to give us the legislation. And it was an excellent example how to make uh, industrial uh, capitalism safe for democracy. Mm -hmm. it, it took decades to get that right uh, with the use of chemicals, harmful substances, child labor, working conditions, uh, uh, unions, uh, social partners playing their full role. Uh, but we were successful. The problem here is we do not have decades we don't sure. have that kind of time. And this is why it's so important that Shoshana's book has been translated to 17 languages. This is why this uh, debate is important. Mm -hmm. Because when, when, you, when you see the landscape, then you can also decide in our democracies how to cultivate it, how to make sure that we have the right boundaries, and then go uh, and, and make the best use of technology, because, because that is the task we have ahead of us. And I think that's the real impact of Susanna's work. This is happening also in my field. You know, academics going out in their landscapes and um, you know, using this kind of uh, insight to pick up new research exactly. questions and so on. Yeah. So, but let's, I mean, we're also at a different moment in time than 9-11 right now. We're also facing a moment where digital transformations um, make themselves very visible. So I think we've seen the benefits in the past months of actually being able to shift work into digital formats of making sure that kids can still go to school and that most activities can sort of at least survive through uh, a pandemic. 
So that, I mean, in some ways, the global lockdown has shown us the, the value of digital technologies as a kind of safety net or a kind of infrastructure that allows for many activities to, to continue. But how can we ensure that we don't sort of uh, make the mistakes that seem to be made during, you know, as a result of 9-11 and this focus on security, on total information awareness and so on? Susanna, any thoughts on this? Well, look, I think that um, <clears throat> what's happened in the context of the pandemic uh, has, um, you know, has, has really just, you know, kind of shown these, these dynamics in very, very clear highlight. And they've shown the tragic consequences of not grappling with these fundamental issues that we've been talking about. Take something as, um, as bounded a professional domain as contact tracing. Public health authorities have been doing contact tracing for a few centuries. In every decade, every century, there are new tools to allow them to do it better. And of course, today they should be able to use digital tools to do it better. We're talking about public health authorities. In democratic societies, public health authorities operate under the rule of law, and they operate under democratic governance. Public health authorities need to be able to see large-scale patterns of how the disease is moving so that they can effectively get in the way of it and, uh, and uh, contain it. The erosion of trust that has come from these two decade old dynamics has completely um, crippled the genuine necessary efforts mm -hmm. of public health authorities to do their work. The information empires led by Google and Apple uh, took their unaccountable power without con uh, uh, conversation without collaboration with governments, developed their own approach, and they, uh, they gaslighted this approach, uh, to follow on Margaret's uh, thinking there, that you know part of our effort is to constantly uh, clear the smog away so we can mm. get to the truth, as Orwell said, to see the nose in front of our face. They, they created a polemic that said our uh, app is the privacy app and what the state is trying to do is to spy on you and undercut the legitimate need of uh, public health authorities that operate under democracy, leaving countries like uh, Germany and, and France and to a certain extent the UK, you know, just in, in, a, in a, you know, in a, in a, in a set of intolerable constraints. So here we are. We have allowed these information empires to own and operate the internet, to own and operate the global means of communication, to own and operate the infrastructure, and to own all of the content. This is intolerable and incompatible with democracy. We have allowed them to drive a wedge between themselves, uh, to drive a wedge between citizens and their rightful democratic governments. This is also intolerable. We have allowed them to cloud the fact that privacy and solidarity are two sides of the same coin. We talked about privacy earlier. Privacy is not private. Privacy is public. A society that has privacy is different from a society that does not. Privacy and solidarity go together. Without a society that has social solidarity, there is no rule of law. Without the rule of law, there are no rights to privacy and there are no other rights. Indeed, there are no individuals. These things are nested together of necessity. And we see the tech companies driving a wedge and we see our states who have the best of intentions in many of these situations left powerless. This is intolerable. So I think that 
the COVID backdrop is showing us the road that we must take, that the state has to clean its own house. The state has to enact those same charters of rights and laws and, and, um, and institutions to keep the, itself, the state, true to democracy and forfeit the surveillance state and at the same time create those rights and laws that oversee the marketplace and outlaw, interrupt, and eliminate surveillance capitalism, which is a new form of economic authoritarianism that has right now hegemonic influence over society. So as Make you mentioned, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so as you say, we've seen the, the emergence of, of contact tracing apps, um, but also the emergence of platforms that allow for work and education to continue and many institutions becoming dependent on licenses from Zoom, Microsoft Teams, and so on. So I think this raises a, a broader question about what can a community like Europe do to sort of build solutions, digital solutions that are our own, so to speak? Is there a sort of room or necessity for maybe national or regional, like European types of uh, approaches to building digital infrastructures? What could I get you to reflect on this? Well, there are then a number of, of different things at, at stake here because mm. uh, Europe completely missed out on sort of the tech to, to consumer uh, business uh, because we failed to have a single market. Both the Chinese and, and the Americans, they had a full single market to, to gain the strength, also to be incredibly successful uh, in Europe. And now we also see the Chinese giants uh, coming in mm -hmm. uh, and we failed to do that. So we should not make the same mistake we need a digital single market, but we also need to see that the European strength is to build sort of the business to business digital infrastructure in a way that is sound, mm -hmm. that still has the transparency. Because one of the things that the founding fathers of the European Union saw very clearly when, when they founded us was the negative role that monopolies had played in the running up to the Second World War. Uh, that uncontrolled power is extremely negative. It doesn't develop society. It, it leads it into being more and more constrained and more and more uh, based on surveillance. So, so we, we know the nature of monopolies. What we have failed to do is, of course, to make sure that, that they are controlled. Because we, we have no, uh, uh, no fear of success. You're more than welcome to be success in Europe. But, but Part of the European idea is that with success comes responsibility. Uh, and now when we have enabled uh, de facto uh, businesses to grow into gatekeepers, mm -hmm. well, then we have to be much more precise to say, well, then what is your responsibility as a gatekeeper? And second, we need to make sure that we do not make room for more gatekeepers because you can be successful without basically owning a full marketplace. Uh, which is the case in, in some of the digital markets where we as consumers, uh, when we use that. So, so in that respect, there are some of the fundamentals that we have not got, gotten right yet. Mm. Uh, and we really need to do that, as I as said, uh, as a matter of, uh, of urgency, because what is at stake here is, is exactly what uh, Shusana said. I think that is the key word, that is trust. Uh, that we can trust what is ongoing actually to be uh, ongoing for the benefit for us as citizens. Because when, when, when a human is seen as a resource and not as a citizen, mm -hmm. well, then democracy is undermined. Um, and, and I think it's, it's very important that we sort of uh, clear the fog to see, well, this is what is ongoing and enable people to have a life uh, full of taking the kids to football or doing your shopping or preparing food or doing your job uh, and not reading through terms and conditions or trying to control your tracing, but to feel that they are safe and empowered because that empowerment is the fundamental uh, of democracy. Uh, and, and I don't think one could ever, ever uh, complain about people uh, not having the right competences. 
it is us who are responsible of giving people a society where whatever uh, you have to do in your life, you can still feel safe and protected and trust that when it's digital, you're still seen as a citizen. Mm. Wonderful. So I think if we um, reflect a little bit on 9-11 and think about, you know, it maybe took us 20 years or at least Shoshana's work to realize that some key things happened at, the, at, at that moment. So to both of you, what do you think in 20 years when we look back at this pandemic, what, what kind of um, reflections, insights will we have? Because this is obviously in some ways the most rapid digital transformation we've ever been through in many workplaces mm -hmm. and institutions and so on, certainly. Who wants to start? Well, at least just one observation is that you, you risk of losing your sense of humor <laughs> because uh, when everyone is muted, right. <laughs> well, there's, 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 no, there's no feedback. Uh, and even your pathetic, you know, you're trying to do something to lighten up, no, uh, uh, no response at all. Uh, I think it has both shown uh, all the good things that we can mm. do with technology, but definitely also its limitations. And the limitation is that we, we, do, not, we do not feel each other as humans, uh, which is why I'm all in favor of using it more, but only when it's useful, mm. not full scale. Uh, because humans, in order to stay human, we need to come together because we educate each other, we develop together, we need each other uh, in order to do that. Mm. Uh, so my hope over the next 20 years is that we will keep technology in its place as a tool uh, and that we will stay proud and, and vigilant uh, about not only our democracy, but also about our marketplace mm. uh, and about the different roles uh, that both should play. Wonderful. Susanna. Any thoughts on this? Oh, yes. Well, yes. Um, beautiful, Margaret. I couldn't agree more. Uh, if we needed to be reminded how much we actually love being together, <laughs> we have a, a global paroxysm mm -hmm. of insight <laughs> about that. Uh, we need to be together. Uh, humans are not meant to be computer mediated. So, mwah, yes. Um, I would add to that, you know, I've been talking for a while about this experience of no escape that in the West, surveillance capitalism has created conditions of no escape. You want to get your kids' grades from the school. You want to get your test results from the doctor's office. You want to make dinner plans with your friends. Each one of these activities marches you through surveillance capitalism supply chains. You want to go into your house and put your feet up and relax, and you've got the smart TV and the smart dishwasher. You've got the sensors and the mattress. Your home is no longer a sanctuary. There is no escape. This experience of no escape is now being um, replicated on steroids everywhere in the world, where the Google educational classform, uh, classroom and its educational tools has, uh, has just, uh, I, I think, something like uh, ten t tenfold times its, uh, its normal usage. According to UNESCO, I think now it's about 80% of students around the world are doing some kind of remote learning, many of them using Google Classroom. But there are other kinds of platforms, too, like Canvas and Blackboard which also have significant surveillance capabilities. Uh, the Attorney General of New Mexico has just brought a suit against uh, Google for its educational tools and its classroom suite, uh, identifying, breaking through that fog, Margaret, and you know, really identifying the huge amounts of data that they're taking about kids, how they track them across the internet, how they integrate it with all the other Google streams of information, and have it as a foundation for tracking those children all the way through their adulthood. Again, intolerable. So I think this experience of no escape, um, which we are talking about, people are talking about it, people are not happy about it, people feel trapped. And the fact that we're all now in this boat, to me, will mark the pandemic as the time of democratic resurgence because so many of us regard this as an intolerable situation that citizens of democratic societies should never have to face. 
And so we are all jointly coming to realize that this is going to operate like the Great Depression. The Great Depression was a terrible crisis, but it brought forth a sense that no more. We must create the institutions, the laws, and the rights that will protect us from this ever happening again. That's, I believe, where we are now. And so 20 years from now, Margaret, if I'm lucky enough to be in conversation with you again, and with you, my beautiful friend, Mikhail, uh, we are going to look back on this and say, in the third decade and the fourth decade, look at the magnificent work we did and just in time. Mm. Thank you. So let's look a little bit to the future and think about if we want to pave that way, if we want to be less naked and so on, what are the kind of initiatives, what are the kind of um, things we can do to, to, to build this a digital world that has more focus on individuals, more focus on democracy, more focus on, on society than, than what we have at the moment. So I wonder if, um, you know, this is a complex task, obviously. If we look at a digital world, it's not just a matter of regulation, it's not just a matter of technology, it's a matter of uh, economics, it's a matter of rights, of ethics, of um, politics, security, I mean, a, a complex of different uh, types of forces and, and issues we de need to deal with. So where do we even start? I mean, is regulation the place to, to look first? W what, what could be some uh, places to, to start addressing these types of challenges? Would anyone start reflecting on this? Well, I, I think, for instance, a simple thing could be to make sure that we have, we have identity that comes from, from our state that we are not happy with the, oh, I can always use my, my Google account or my Facebook account or, or whatever account, but that I have my own identity that is independent on whatever business out there. Mm -hmm. I think that is a fundamental because it comes with citizenship that I can identify myself, that we are not having to do that via different ecosystems, and that our, our democracy sets uh, the framework to say, well, you're obliged for things to be able to operate together. You cannot just build your own secluded uh, community because on the internet, de facto now, we have gated communities. You're more than welcome to enter, but the question is, can you leave? Mm -hmm. uh, and and that, these are the fundamentals that we'll have to get right, that you can identify yourself, that different services are obliged uh, to work together, mm -hmm. and that people are empowered to decide when do I want to share and when do I not want to share? Uh, because it's a good thing to share. Mm. A lot of positive things comes with sharing. Uh, a lot of good research can be done uh, if, you, if you share and you share your data, but you should be uh, the one to decide when to do this mm. and with whom to share. So we are sort of back in the fundamentals of the, the US Constitution, uh, the European Treaty, the constitutions of the, of the different member states in order to, to figure what constitutes the fundamentals of, of a democracy in, in a digital age. So identity is one area, um, and regulation in terms of opening up platforms and different, as you say, walled gardens is another. Are we then talking about breaking up companies, or are we talking about some principles for interoperability, so that one of the reasons why people stay on Facebook, even they, if, if they may have concerns about it, like the ones you raised, Josana, or simply be sick of it, is that all their content, all their pictures, and all their friends are there. So how do you ensure this kind of opening up of walled gardens? Is that about, you know, f forcing companies to allow us to write a message from Twitter into Instagram and something like this, or, or what are we talking about? I have been a little bit reluctant with these ideas of, of breaking up, uh, first sort of from a very practical point of view, how to do that without just ending up in a courtroom like forever, mm -hmm. uh, and thinking about this story about the Hydra. If you chub off one head, you, get, you just get seven back. Sure. Um, so no, I, I'm more back to say, well, it's about identity, it, it's about property. Uh, these have been the fundamentals in, in all societal developments. Uh, that you have the right to establish yourself as a citizen. It has been what we have been fighting for with, 
with the debates about structural racism, it is still what we are fighting for, to establish yourself as a citizen equal with other citizens. And that also goes with uh, our digital world, to be able to establish yourself as a citizen, that it is your property. Mm. Your data is your property, mm. and you should be able to decide what, what happens with it. Uh, and of course here we need regulation, but we also need the market response uh, to develop tools that, that's built on that. So that, because without, without also engaging the market, uh, there is a risk that we will be too weak. Mm. Uh, because what we are dealing with is, is amazing economic powers that need to change. And of course that kind of change comes with the resistance. Mm. Uh, sometimes I wonder when, when I hear sort of the, uh, also when the platforms ask for regulation, I think, well, probably because they trust us to be so heavy handed uh, that they can deal with it, but the smaller ones cannot deal mm. with it. Uh, and that, of course, challenge accepted mm. uh, because we have to find ways to say, well, with, with, with being a, a gatekeeper comes special responsibility that is not for the smaller ones who just want to compete with you and, and deliver new solutions for, uh, for us in the health sector or, or in education uh, without uh, reducing the patient or the pupil uh, to a product. Mm. So, Shusana, do you think these fundamentals will solve what you call surveillance capitalism? Or what, what else do we need? Well, look, <clears throat> I think that um, this is a, a multilateral approach. Mm. <laughs> so ideally, we're working, first of all, on two levels. One is we need uh, an analysis and a vision of where we want to go. Um, and then, and then it, it is in the nature of of lawmaking and institution building, that there are some things that uh, that are first in the queue because they're most urgent, because they're politically feasible, right? So, so, so there's going to be a multi a multiplicity of of specific uh, efforts and specific undertakings, but ideally, we want to see our lawmakers. Uh, having a coordinated uh, approach so that each one of those pieces not only aligned with one another, but aligned with a larger vision. This is not always the way that, uh, that things proceed, but I think there is an opportunity now for that. Let me give you an example. Uh, when we were in the early part of the 20th century, in U.S. law, which I know best, <clears throat> one of the greatest obstacles was that every single court decision favored property rights over all other rights. And in part, that was because there were new rights that needed to be translated into law. They were rights that people felt. They felt that it was a right to get together collectively, to pool their labor power, and form unions and have the right to strike, have the right to bargain. But these rights were not codified in law. Rights become laws at a certain moment in history when what we feel to be an elemental right comes under attack by political conditions. Today, we are in a similar situation. We feel that our experience should be private. That feels like a right, but that right is not codified in law. The fact that it is not codified in law has led us into conversations that always begin with the word data. Mm. We're arguing about data, data access, data portability, who owns the data, and so forth. But data is a second order phenomenon. Mm. First, they invade our experience without our knowledge. Second, they steal it for translation into data. Third, they say we own the data. And then it goes into production and sales, resulting in a handful of companies now that in the United States account for 20% of the market capitalization of the, of the US stock market. Huge concentrations of wealth as a result of this foundational act of theft 
illegitimate. So we, you know, we're talking before about faces. They take my face. The surveillance capitalists fought bitterly for the right to take people's faces wherever they encounter them on the street, on your Facebook page, whatever it may be. So we have rights here that we feel that are not yet codified in law. Part of the big picture is we need to be working on the charters of rights that are necessary in this historical moment, rights that never came under fire before but are now under attack. I call these, to begin with, epistemic rights, the rights to know. Who gets to know about my life? Who decides who gets to know? Who decides who decides who gets to know? These issues of knowledge, authority, and power need to be translated into rights. As we begin to identify these rights, we have the tools to truly interrupt and outlaw surveillance capitalism. Because taking my face is an act of theft. And it should be a criminal act. If I'm going to give my face for an enterprise that's collecting data, maybe for disease treatment, maybe for uh, improving some other aspect of public health, uh, then this is my choice. Mm. And I do it transparently. And uh, I do it understanding. Uh, what my data will be used for, how it will be used, how it will be shared, and so on and so forth. So from these rights, we can develop the tools, the laws, and the institutions that we need to fundamentally change. Because, final point, one of the great tragedies today, not only the concentration of wealth, the concentration of knowledge, and the concentration of power, and a handful of companies who now operate with unaccountable power, great information empires. But the fact that all of these global data that they have amassed are not being used for the public good. They are not being used to cure disease. They are not being used to cure climate catastrophe. They are not being used to flood the world with smart, loving doctors and teachers. They are being used in a very narrow way, parasitically, to advance the narrow financial interests of surveillance capitalists and their clients. So not only <laughs> have we created this horrible, uh, feudal sort of pattern to our society with these concentrations of wealth and power and data in a few hands, but as democracies, we are shut out from the data that we need to improve our lives and our societies. So interrupting, outlawing this rogue economic logic frees us for the public uses, for the businesses that want to get out there and compete, not just to be parasitic, but to actually solve my problems and solve society's problems. There are so many people that want to be doing that, but they can't now because they have to compete with surveillance capitalism. And surveillance capitalism can make so much money illegitimately that it attracts all the investment. And so we have a very uneven competitive situation. These are the things that we can take action on over the next decade. That's my expectation. And what kind of action can we take if we want to make digital transformations, digital technologies into more of a public good than what it is today. And also maybe prevent the, the worst kind of logics and solutions from the private sector to travel into the, to the public one. What are the kinds of initiatives that you uh, consider relevant in this, in this regard? Well, well, part of it is, is uh, funding uh, people who wants to do something else. Uh, I just visited a, a team of, uh, of, uh, of doctors uh, and their technicians. Uh, who are now launching uh, artificial intelligence to help them from a basis of a blood test within 60 minutes to give uh, an answer to 23 tests that can give you uh, a very precise answer as to whether or not there may be a high risk of cancer. So, so your doctor can be with you as a patient uh, in, as, as said, as, a, as an empathic uh, guide uh, to say, well, this is, this is how to do things. So making more room 
for the human in the relation mm. because the technology can help us. So, so to fund that kind of things, to make sure that all the things that happens mm. uh, that are proper, uh, that they can, they can prosper. Mm. Because in, in doing that, we can create a confidence, trust in the technology, but also confidence that we can do it. Because very often I'm being asked, shouldn't we just surrender? Mm. Because it's, it's all lost. Uh, we, now we're in it. Then, then why keep struggling? And I think, well, no, uh, we have what it takes and we should have the self-confidence because this is what we have done uh, over the centuries uh, in building our societies. Uh, so, so now with, uh, with, uh, with the light that Shusana and, and others are, are throwing in, uh, in the intellectual work, uh, we can address this and we can have a, a discussion that's where we, where we take upon ourselves the responsibility and the obligation to put that discussion into legislation and into implementation, obviously. Uh, and that is happening right now. Uh, the white paper on, on AI out in consultation, uh, public consultation on, on the responsibility of those who provide that digital services, how to prevent new gatekeepers from arising, how to give clear obligations, do's and do nots, to those who are gatekeeping right now, uh, to say, well, we need a community to do this, and, and it's happening right now, and we should be confident that the European, the, the Western, so to speak, model, because here we have so many friends in the US mm. who wants to do the same thing, that we should have the confidence that, of course, this is possible. Thank you so much. I think this conversation shows that even asking critical questions and challenging the terms and conditions of digital transformations is also a way forward. Mm. It also opens up a different kind of digital future. I want to thank both of you for joining us today and I want to thank the audience for uh, checking in. Wonderful to have you here it and I hope great. we meet and again. It's such an honor to be with you, Shoshana. Very much so. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Brad. It's such an honor to be with you. I'm so proud of all the work you're doing. Thank you, Mikael. Thank you. What a thank beautiful you. what a beautiful opportunity.